The polarising nature of The Last Jedi is a firmly cemented staple of discussion within the Star Wars fandom at this point, with many decrying the film for being comprised of a long list of offences and in fact even feeling personally insulted by it, the other side making claims of the film bringing much needed deviation from the originals, providing interesting political commentary, a unique self-reflective commentary on Star Wars itself, and more. For the purpose of this video, let's focus on the first group, those who felt personally insulted by the film and its messaging. For now we'll put aside all the thoroughly discussed, more minor mimetic gripes, and indeed the deeper criticisms about how things such as the Force were handled and how the philosophy and legacy of the Jedi were torn down. Instead we'll be looking at one particular component of the thematic makeup of this film and why it had such an impact on the audience, be it positive or negative, conscious or subconscious. In this video we'll be delving into the film's prominently displayed metafictionality, specifically with regards to one aspect. That aspect is the new take on war, and the wars fought in the Star Wars film series. In The Last Jedi, a new level of influence over the war between the First Order and the Resistance is revealed, this being the arms manufacturers who facilitate conflict between the two sides. This reveal perhaps invites the audience to now infer these arms dealers to have long been in the background amongst these galactic civilizations, profiting from death and destruction, acting as the parasites of war. The film's military-industrial complex revelation is dramatised with Finn discovering a new and unsettling truth about the war in which he is fighting, the war for which his friends die and endanger themselves, that which has caused so much horror and destruction across the galaxy. The Codebreaker is shown to be an opportunistic, thieving scoundrel. Freshly added to his list of crimes is the theft of a ship used to escape Canto Bight, the planet on which he'd been imprisoned. When aboard this ship, after initial ignorance, Finn eventually realises it is stolen, but justifies the theft by claiming that at least the Codebreaker is helping the good guys and not the bad. The Codebreaker dismisses this claim by asserting that good guys and bad guys are just made up words. He then reveals that the owner of the ship they are travelling aboard is an arms dealer who made his money selling weapons to the First Order and the Resistance meaning the so-called good guys and bad guys. This muddies the waters. The supposed good guys and the bad guys now seem like mere cogs in a greater war machine. The notion of good attempting to triumph over evil is cast into doubt. Of course, the fact that there is an amoral third party supplying both sides of the conflict does not necessarily negate the idea that this war is between good and evil. It could still be a battle between good and evil, with this impartial third party profiting from the chaos, but it does complicate matters, and does call into question the level to which both sides are being manipulated, perhaps prodded into making the war continue. Maybe peace would be more likely without these arms dealers facilitating the fighting, or perhaps the side with more resources would simply build their own weapons and crush the opposition that way. Perhaps with one side defeated thusly, peace could result or tyranny could reign. This reveal is demonstrative of the concept at the heart of Plato's allegory of the cave. Perhaps the most prominent pop culture staple of recent decades which popularised this concept is The Matrix. This film enlightened the wider public to an understanding of the principles of the allegory, with the reveal that Neo had been living in a simulation, and the life he had always known had been an elaborate lie a system of control for machine overlords to use him, along with the rest of the human race, to serve their ends of generating electricity, and of keeping their historical enemies, again the human race, pacified. Then later, in the second film, Neo, thought to be the one, is not as special as he was earlier shown to be, is in fact not the one, but one of many ones. His place as a unique, system-breaking saviour is just an illusion, another lie for him to discover. He is in fact just another cog in the Machine Overlord's system of control. Although maybe not really in the end, but that's a rather big tangent. At the heart of Plato's allegory is a lesson on breaking through one's current perception of reality, to learn of the true reality beyond. But how is this relevant? Well. Through this platonic reveal, the audience is invited to share in Finn's experience. Much like Finn is pushed into casting aside his previous perception of the Star Wars universe and what drives its wars, the audience is invited to do the same. 
to recontextualize the universe and the past of Star Wars. The critique of war is divided into numerous other aspects, one of these being the cyclical nature of war. This critique extends out to join forces with the other meta-critique of holding on to the past. The film arguably implies that, as well as leaving the past of Star Wars behind, the audience should also leave behind their enjoyment of the wars fought on screen, and that these wars are in fact one of the things of old Star Wars that need to die. Another of these aspects is the criticism of the glamorization of war, and more specifically, certain behaviours which can be traditionally valorised in much of cinema, such as Poe's brand of reckless heroism. There are also things like Admiral Akbar being unceremoniously killed in a space battle, which shows how unglamorous and nihilistic war is. Of course, soldiers on both sides of the conflict are shown to be killed without ceremony in many battles in Star Wars, but using a beloved legacy character for this purpose attracts the audience's attention more, and makes them feel a closer simulation of that sense of nihilistic horror at what they're witnessing, than when countless unnamed soldiers are shown to be killed in these battles. Because the audience is numb to these kinds of deaths, these soldiers don't have names and simply function as cannon fodder in these grand spectacles of simulated war. Now to Luke's refusal to help the resistance. Beyond aiding them, he refuses to engage in any more war at all, because through his experiences he has become aware of the endless, cyclical, pointless nature of it all. After reconstituting the Jedi Order, Luke made similar enough mistakes to the former Jedi in their creation of that which destroyed them, or at least that's his perception. After restoring peace to the galaxy, and rebuilding what was previously destroyed, he didn't learn from the mistakes of the past which led to the downfall of democracy in the first place. He fostered the conditions for a new villain to rise and overthrow the Jedi once more. To draw another comparison to the Matrix films, Luke simply reloaded the cycle to begin again, much like all of Neo's predecessors did when reintegrating their source code to reload the Matrix for its next cycle. Luke has come to the conclusion that to break the cycle, the Jedi must not rise again. Passivity is adopted, and the fight against the First Order abandoned by him. This also translates to a meta-reading, i.e. it highlights the cyclical nature of the direction of Star Wars itself, if the film before this was anything to go by. Related to that, The Last Jedi is an attempt to break away from this cycle, and forge something new for the future. It seems apparent that Kylo Ren also recognises the repetitive cycles these wars have been going through. He offers Rey the chance to allow the Resistance to be wiped out, join him and bring peace to the galaxy. When she is reluctant, he angrily scorns her for holding on to the ways of the past, which the film thus far has so aggressively denounced. He also asserts that the time has come to let old things die, then listing all the things that need to die from the past of Star Wars, the Jedi, the Skywalker name, the Rebels, etc. Rey rejects his offer, instead choosing to continue perpetuating the cycle of war, a strange choice for the direction of the film, incongruent with its messaging. One could assume that, without implicit or explicit corporate mandates for the direction of Rey's character, the opposite choice may have been made, that being that she joined Kylo, and together, with the light and dark side now working in confluence rather than conflict, a new way forward could have truly been forged. With dark and light united, integrated and balancing each other, peace could have, in theory, truly been established. As alluded to earlier, this meta-critique of war, by extension, also serves as a critique of the Star Wars franchise and its fan base, and in a way, the corporation which makes the films. Because the audience is bathing in enjoyment of perpetuating war on screen, and the company is profiting from continuing to generate these images of war over and over. In a sense, profiting from death, like the arms dealers in the film. So certain audience members may have felt insulted by The Last Jedi, because they were being insulted. Told that on some level they were wrong for enjoying Star Wars, and that perpetuating this cycle of repetitive war is something to be subtly derided for. Thus it becomes not just a critique of war, but by proxy, whether intentionally or unintentionally, a critique of the audience's enjoyment of the spectacle of war. A critique of the audience's enjoyment of Star Wars. But what do you think? Do you agree with this analysis? Or do you have any contrasting interpretations? Do you like the film? Do you dislike it? Or do you have mixed feelings on it? Let me know in the comments below, leave a like if you enjoyed, 
Subscribe for more videos like this, and others about other stuff too. Check out my video on the significance of the Holdo Maneuver if you're interested. Thanks for watching, see you next time.